Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first podcast for day 19, chapter 18. In this podcast, we're going to talk about the general concept of gene regulation and then focus in on bacterial gene regulation. In the next podcast, we will focus on eukaryotic gene regulation. Let's go ahead and get started then. So there are many different levels of gene regulation in cells. Even though this podcast is on bacteria, I'm going to draw out the whole process, including eukaryotics, and then focus in on what bacteria uh, do and do quite well. So let's draw the, a part of a cell here. And if you remember from the last chapter we talked about, we talked about these receptors, and we talked about these signals that will bind to these receptors. And we said when they bind to this receptor, we undergo uh, this initial reception and then a transduction of that signal and then a response. So I, I guess for just completeness we can write transduction just so we don't forget that's really is what ha is happening in most cases when we turn on gene when we regulate a gene. And then what we're going to focus on mainly today is this response. So because I'm going to draw a lot here I'm going to draw an abnormally large DNA mole I'm sorry nucleus. So through this transduction pathway, the gene located on the DNA here, so let's just draw a, kind of a generic DNA double helix here. And we know that this gene next is transcribed. I'm going to use my abbreviation for transcription, TXN. So through transcription, we make a messenger RNA. Then we learned how this messenger RNA was modified. So let's write modified on this arrow. And let's draw this modified messenger RNA here. We have our G cap, just to remind you. And we have our messenger RNA with the poly A tail. And we're going to say splice to. I'm not going to draw it being splice, but when you look at this mature RNA here, this would be our mature RNA. It has the G cap, the poly A tail, and the introns have been spliced out. The next thing that happens is that this is exported out of the nucleus. So let's write export, nuclear export. And then our mature RNA in the cytoplasm. Now we're in the cytoplasm. We have our G cap with our messenger RNA message and our poly A tail. The next thing that happens is that this will be translated in the cytoplasm. And again, I'm showing this in the, from the eukaryotic perspective. So now we have translation of this mature messenger RNA and we end up with a protein. Then this protein folds properly and is itself modified through the process that we learned was called post-translational because it occurs after translation. Post-translational modification. And remember we said when this occurs, things like phosphate groups can be added, methyl groups can be added, acetyl groups can be added. A lot of different small chemicals can be added to help that protein achieve its full functional status. And now what we have is our mature protein able to do its job. And at some point what could happen is that this mature protein will be degraded. So in red here, I'm going to number the number of ways that a gene can be regulated. It can be regulated at the very first step here when the cell is signal to turn this on. It could also be an in intracellular signal, but we drew it as this plasma membrane being signal. Next, the gene can be regulated at the level of the chromosome. 
you know, how we talked about how the chromosome can be packed and unpacked. Well, if we want this gene to be turned on, we need to unpack that chromosome. So it can be regulated at this level. It can also be regulated at the level of transcription. It can be modif uh, regulated at the level of modification. So a gene could have the messenger RNA all made, and we're going to regulate whether or not it proceeds to make a protein by regulating when and how it gets modified. Another method is at the level of export. Some genes may have all their messenger RNA fully processed and just sitting in the nucleus and waiting to be exported. So it could have received the signal, it could have done all these other preceding steps, all these other preceding steps. And now it's just waiting to be exported. And that's how this gene is regulated, deciding whether or not to send this mature messenger RNA out into the, the cytoplasm. Then we can have regulation at the level of translation. In some cases, we can have pools of messenger RNA sitting in the cytoplasm waiting to be translated into protein, but they're not just automatically translated. That could be regulated as well. And then, uh, not finally, but almost finally, the seventh way here is at the level of protein folding and post-translational modification. You can have a fully, func uh, fully translated protein, but it's still not functional. And so we can regulate whether or not this gene is ultimately expressed into this protein at the level of folding and post-translational modification until we finally get this mature protein. Now the last level that it can be regulated at is the level of degradation. How long do we allow this protein to exist in the cytoplasm or wherever it happens to be before we degrade it. So this is another very important level of gene regulation. Now, we say this is gene regulation because ultimately it is, but be careful because sometimes the regulatory steps occur after the gene has had anything to do with the picture. So even at, as we said before, even at this part of the process where you have the mature protein, we still call that gene regulation. Okay, pretty soon we're going to focus just on bacterial uh, gene regulation. And bacteria are, are kings of, of biochemistry. They're, they're essentially a membrane sac of biochemical reactions. That's what they are. And they do biochemistry better than anything. But they regulate their genes primarily at this level of transcription. And they can also regulate it at this level of protein, but not so much in the folding process, but in a pathway process. And so let's talk about that pathway process first. As I said, bacteria perform biochemistry better than any cell can. So I'm going to just write biochemical pathway here. Let's begin with just a quick description about some cool things about bacteria. Bacteria, bacteria have to respond to their environment in a way that is much more rapid than I would imagine any other cell on Earth. Because they can one moment be in the digestive tract, and then the next moment they could be out of your digestive tract. They could be sitting in soil, then all of a sudden washed away into another environment. They could be quickly taken into a higher pH to a lower pH. The, the temperature changes drastically on them. And there is such a small size here that they have to be able to respond to this environment stress very quickly. And they do this, as I said before, primarily by turning on and off genes and mastering their biochemistry. So all these arrows indicate that this little bacteria here, I'm gonna put BAC, because that's all I'll be able to write in here, BAC, this bacteria has to constantly react to the environment. And as I said before, they do it better than almost any other cell, probably any other cell. One way they do it is by regulating biochemical pathways. Your book talks about tryptophan, so we'll stick with tryptophan too. So let's say our goal, and we'll write it over here, is to make tryptophan, and I'm gonna abbreviate tryptophan as just TRP. The cell receives some kind of a signal for tryptophan, for the, for the cell to make tryptophan. This signal will primarily come, from, come in the form of the cell being placed in an environment with no tryptophan. So the cell has to start making its own tryptophan. So it receives this signal that there, there's no tryptophan available and it will turn on a gene, and we'll talk about gene regulation in, in a moment, but it turns on a gene and it makes a protein, and we'll call this tryptophan intermediate 1. And then intermediate 1 will turn on the expression and, and make intermediate 2. And then intermediate 2 will activate this intermediate 3. 
Now, I should mention these are three different proteins. It doesn't change from one to the other. This intermediate one is a protein, intermediate two is a different protein, intermediate three is a, a finally a separate protein. And eventually, at some point, tryptophan is made. And much rejoicing is had by the cell. It just made tryptophan, and it needed tryptophan. Now, because the bacteria is constantly concerned about its energy, because of its small size, and because it has to um, um, regulate how it uses in, its energy very efficiently, once it has enough tryptophan to survive, it doesn't want to keep making this, e even if it's in an environment with no tryptophan. It's just made a large amount of tryptophan, and now the bacterium wants to divert its energy to some other process. So what will happen is there will be a, this negative um, feedback loop here that will take this tryptophan that's just been made, and in one of these steps, it doesn't really matter which one, it depends on the pathway we're talking about, but it blocks this pathway by blocking one of these intermediates and doesn't allow one of these intermediates to go to the next one. So once the cell has enough tryptophan or whatever amino acid or nucleic acid or vitamin it's making at that time, that concentration as it builds up, it will go back and block the pathway itself. In this way, the bacteria can now divert its energy to other cool things it's doing. All right, on the last next slide, and it'll be the last slide for this podcast, I want to talk about how the bacterium will regulate their genes. And so they primarily do this at the level of transcription. So we're going to put bacteria gene regulation and focus on transcription. This is the main way bacteria regulate their genes. In talking about this, the LAC operon is the classic example. We know quite a bit about the LAC operon, and, and because of that, it provides a lot of really cool examples into how bacteria regulate, regulates their, their genes at the level of transcription. You will probably get LAC operon as you move up the curriculum. You'll get it in microbiology. You'll get it um, probably in cell biology. You'll get it again in genetics. And in each of these classes, we're going to add a new layer of the LAC operon um, onto you. So what we're going to talk about today is kind of the basics of the LAC operon. And first, let's introduce this term operon. Bacteria do a really clever thing. All their genes, I'm pretty sure all their genes, maybe not all of them, at least most of their genes, are placed into these what we call operons. And so what is an operon? An operon has several parts. It has a promoter that we've already been introduced to. It has an oper operator. And then it has several genes. And for the LAC operon, these are LAC Z, LAC Y, that's supposed to be a Y, I'm sorry, and LAC A. And the really interesting thing about operons is that once you turn this gene on, activate it, and you begin to make that messenger RNA through transcription, you will make a single messenger RNA that has the LAC Z gene encoded on it, the LAC Y gene encoded on it, and the LAC A gene encoded on it. So when this makes a messenger RNA, let's just go ahead and draw it. So when this is transcribed, we're going to have a messenger RNA that has the LAC Z gene on it, the LAC Y gene on it, and then the LAC A gene on it. This is then translated and it will make the LAC Z protein. I'm going to just make a Z here with a circle around it. The Y protein and the A protein. Again, remember, let's go back here and write TXN for transcription and then TLN for translation. Now remember that this is different than what we've learned before. And it's different when we go to gene regulation in eukaryotes. In eukaryotes, we're going to have a LAC Z 
we, well, we would have one gene under the control of one promoter. We would have another gene under the control of a promoter, and so on. One promoter, one gene. Bacteria, though, have one promoter, several genes. And these genes that are under the control of a single promoter are all linked in the, that same biochemical pathway. Every gene in a, a, a single operon has a function in a similar pathway. So for instance, these are the only three genes necessary to metabolize lactose. We turn this promoter on and we make a single transcript, which then makes these three proteins, which is all the bacteria needs to metabolize lactose. This way, remember we said that bacteria, they're under this constant assault of, of environmental pressures. And so they have to respond really quickly. They can respond really quickly by having this single promoter turning these three genes on at the exact same time. So we have make the proteins at the exact same um, um, time as well. This is a very efficient system for, for the bacteria. Now let's go back and define some of these terms and explain how the bacteria will regulate this operon. The promoter is just as we have learned previously. The promoter will bind the RNA polymerase. So I'm just going to draw an RNA polymerase above the promoter. And I'm going to write RNAP in here just so we remember that this is the RNA polymerase. And when it binds here, it turns on and makes the, the mRNA for LACZ, LACY, and LACA. So what's this operator doing here? Well, the operator is, is the key to regulating this entire operon. So there's this other gene over here. It's not, not part of the operon. It's a separate one. And we're going to call this LACI. And when LACI, and it has its own promoter, we should make that clear, has its own promoter, and LACI makes a repressor. So let's draw the repressor here. This is a repressor. The repressor now will come up here and it will bind to the operator. So let's draw this above our operator and put the R in it because it's a repressor. Now with a name like repressor, you can probably guess what it's going to do. It's going to repress transcription. So as long as this repressor is bound to the operator, the RNA polymerase may be bound to the promoter, but it gets blocked. It can't get past the repressor. It, it serves as a roadblock for it. It'll keep moving, hit this repressor, bounce off, hit the repressor, bounce off, and um, if, if an enzyme could ever be frustrated, this enzyme would get very frustrated because it just can't get past this roadblock. Now, how do we remove this repressor? Because at some point, we do want to make these genes so that we can metabolize lactose. But remember, we said bacteria are incredibly efficient, probably one of the most efficient cells we have. They don't want to make, spend energy on making lac Z, lac Y, and lac A. There's no sense in doing that unless lactose comes into the cell. I'm not sure how bright yellow will be, but let's make lactose yellow. So lactose here enters the cell, our hero, right, enters the cell. And I'm going to draw it as a very small molecule, kind of like as a, well, we'll just draw it like that. What happens is when lactose comes along here and binds to the repressor, so we're going to bind it like so, it's bound to the repressor. What happens is, well, first of all, when lactose enters the cell, remember that the, the cell needs to metabolize it. So we need to turn these genes on. So we have to remove the repressor. Lactose binds to the repressor. That changes the shape of the repressor in such a way that the repressor now falls off the operator. So here's a repressor with our lactose um, sugar in it, and it stays off. And as long as it's bound to this lactose sugar, the, the repressor is, it will not bind back to the operator because it, it physically can't. It's changed its shape. Now, once that's gone, I can't really erase the repressor from here because the system I work with doesn't use it, but we'll just kind of scribble it out. Now what happens is RNA polymerase, when it's bound to the promoter, it's no longer blocked. It can now go right through this area here and transcribe lac Z, lac Y, lac A, just as we talked about before. Once the lactose is completely metabolized, the lactose will fall off because it's, it's gone now because it's just been metabolized. 
it's no longer bound to the repressor, and now the repressor can bind back to operate, turning it off. Again, remember, bacteria, very efficient organisms, when, when you don't need to turn on a gene, they quickly turn it off because they need to conserve that energy because they have no idea what the environment's going to throw at them next. All right, well, that ends our podcast for um, the, the first objective for this chapter here. Um, on the next podcast, we'll focus on eukaryotic gene regulation. Not surprisingly, it's a little bit more complicated because there are many there are other parts involved. But we'll get to that in the next podcast. If you have any questions, let us know. See you in class. Bye.